Hi everyone, it's wonderful to see so many interested folks coming out to hear what we expect to be a really great program that will have a big impact on food, local food, and a lot of the issues we're all concerned with tonight. Um, I represent Sustainable Tucson up here. Uh, the mission of Sustainable Tucson is to create a community-wide network of people and organizations facilitating and accelerating Tucson's transition to sustainability through education and collaborative action. And if you go to our website, you'll see that the first item, the very first item under our vision, apropos of tonight's event, is that food is safe, healthy, and regionally produced. And that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. I know a lot of you either represent or could name a lot of food-based and food-oriented organizations, producers, distributors, uh, all kinds of... Tucson is very lucky to have all kinds of folks involved in food issues. Um, Specifically tonight, we won't go into everyone, but you can hear probably during the discussion you'll hear about some of the others. But tonight we're honored to be joined for the presentation with an outstanding group of co-sponsors representing some of the key players in local food efforts here in Tucson and in southern Arizona. The Pima County Food Alliance, which is our local food council, representing a lot of small producers in the region, a lot of school to um, farm to school issues, and many other food related uh, concepts. Native Seed Search is in the back there. Um, saving the diversity of our native seeds and ensuring that they will be available for a long and fruitful and vegetable full future. <laughs> Community of Gardens of Tucson is here and they provide access to gardening and agricultural plots for uh, small growers throughout the community. Um, Gary Nabhan is with the UA Southwest Center and also Sabores Sin Fronteras Foodways Alliance which, which is focused on food traditions across the border and um, bringing together producers and um, distributors on both sides of our border. Iskashita Refugee Network, um, which is a group which gleans fruit and vegetables from people's yards with teams of refugees and American volunteers as a way of integrating our new Americans into the community and making sure that no, let me see if I can remember it, no fruit gets left behind. <laughs> <laughs> Local First Arizona is also in the back there. Um, supporting a lot of our local businesses, not just those connected with food, but throughout the community, small, locally owned businesses. Rizzo Nation Farm is here, and they are a small producer um, and beekeeper, and they're, they've got material there. Plant-Based Nation does education and outreach throughout the community on um, moving towards becoming a healthful plant-based um, people. Local Roots Aquaponics, which is a, an aquaponics business, growing food and fish in a symbiotic relationship so that we save water and we are growing locally. Uh, local Food Concepts, a newsletter, uh, Judith Matson is here, and Local uh, Food con um, Concepts 
keeps us up to date on what's going on in the local food scene, and Abundant Communities Trust, a group that is working now to turn one of the closed TUSD schools into a sustainability resource center, including um, a farm, aquaponics, and, and community gardens, and many other sustainability issues. Okay, so we thank our co-sponsors. Um, I think what we're going to do, because we have a very packed program tonight, and a packed auditorium, um, we'll see if we have time at the end, if people have announcements, but at this point, I want to turn things over to Trace to introduce our speakers, and without further ado, we'll get started on our program. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank the co-sponsors. Just hearing that list of co-sponsors was enough to make my mouth water. A lot of stuff is happening in and around Tucson that we all need to celebrate. And I would say about half that stuff is new within the last uh, three or four years. Uh, should we shoot out the lights? Can we? Uh, yeah, uh, drop those a couple notches. So really what gives me hope is this incredible um, excitement that all of these nonprofits and for-profits are doing. We need that mix of nonprofits and for-profits to get us to the next step with a healthy, just, uh, resilient food system. And many of you are involved in that effort. And I'm going to ask you for participation during this talk. I'm, I'm going to focus on these 10 things that we can do to really uh, uh, jumpstart our food system. Do, do any of the women here know that book, How to Jumpstart Your Husband? <laughs> this is a little bit like, like that process. If someone's kind of fallen asleep, lost a little bit of the spark, we need to bring the spark back to Tucson's food system and the many groups that are co-sponsoring this uh, are doing that. So as I come through each of the 10 points that I'll be talking about, I'm going to ask those of you who are working on that point to stand up. And the reason that I'm doing this is that uh, my disclaimer right off the start is these are not my ideas. These are collective ideas that come out of many, many discussions of the Pima County Food Alliance and other groups uh, here are working on, and also bar borrowing from other communities, like the great work you'll hear about from uh, that Michael and uh, Lynette Marie are doing. So um, we can't go into what every group is doing, but at certain points I'm going to have everyone stand up who's working on a particular issue. So let's get started. Uh, that uh, green and white uh, Arizona map is how the conventional commodified food system works in Arizona. Um, uh, primary agriculture, uh, 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 citrus production, uh, lettuce production down in Yuma County, beef production across the state. We have more ranches and farms in this state. Um, and a lot of that goes out to other uh, States, of course, and a lot more food comes into Arizona. And then a view of the next desert oasis, which is this place that's now being transformed into what it was 400 years ago as, a, as an oasis where food is being produced with the little water we have in a way that doesn't further deplete that water. Many projects from desert survivors to the permaculture guild uh, uh, to desert harvesters that are moving this diversity back into our community, wild and cultivated plant and animal. And that transformation is going on as we sit uh, together and, and uh, dialogue today. So I'm going to suggest that even though there's some incredibly huge challenges we're facing, there's a lot of cultural and natural assets in southern Arizona that I think are going to bring us through. Okay, uh, a few comments right off. This was in the Arizona Repulsive, our largest uh, newspaper in the state, uh, just a couple weeks ago in this incredible series by Sean McKinnon 
if you haven't seen it, a five-part series on water and the future of Arizona. And the former Central Arizona Project general manager said, if we're not feeling the present, the pressure to avert future risk, not feeling the discomfort or pain, we don't always deal with the future problem. It seems like we're always behind the curve and we need to be visionary again. We need to be visionary. There's no single person organization here that can do this alone. All of the organizations mentioned as sponsors, plus many more, have to be on board to make the change we need right now. Oops, backwards. And, and that's because we're not just in a desert. We're not just in a food desert as the USDA defines it. And this map of the pink areas show the, the nine urban food deserts within Metro Tucson. But we are now in a food toxic dead zone. What I mean by that is the food desert mapping allowed uh, Walmart and several other chains to come in with big, big box stores to all the food deserts in Arizona, a half billion dollars subsidies from the federal government to, uh, so that those places would have so-called fresh food. How many of you looked for fresh food in a Walmart before? How many of you saw it? That was a quick, easy uh, uh, one. So, so what we're getting is um, uh, just like the dead zone uh, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico below the Mississippi River Delta, we're getting the buildup of toxic nutrients in our community that has enormous health consequences for the next 50 years, what I'm calling the nutritional cliff, which is also the real fiscal cliff that Arizona is facing, and we'll get to that in a moment. But the point is 700,000 uh, Arizonans now live in these so-called uh, food deserts that are being transformed to food dead zones. And so uh, something that Michael and Lynette Marie and I have talked about a lot uh, the last two days, no problem can be solved by the very same consciousness that created the problem in the first place. This means whole systems thinking. This means collaboration, not just competition. Uh, uh, this means all of you as co-designers of a just and healthy food system Part of why we're in the trouble we are is that we've defaulted, we've let companies and the government to some extent design a food system and is it isn't working. We all have to take the role again, participatory role as co-designers of a better food system. And why I think you'll see tangible examples in both my talk and Michael's is that any cultural movement will fail if I can't paint a picture of the world where we want to go. Okay, let's look at that uh, vision. In this vision, uh, food and farming microenterprises in southern Arizona and Metro Tucson in particular are key to the entire economic recovery of our failed economy here. What I'm saying is that study after study has shown in other communities that the first thing to get moving once the the intelligence and, and uh, cultural assets of the community get rolling again is food microenterprises. It's a, a low cost entry for the first part, like the food carts around this town were tied for LA as uh, the food cart uh, uh, taco wagon uh, capital of the United States with a higher density than any other towns except LA in the whole uh, country. Those are our businesses that are feeding people that may not even be able to go to Burger King for a $7.99 basic meal anymore. People are eating off the streets for $2.50 to $3.50. We need food microenterprises of all different scales to jumpstart our flagging economy. So this is one entry point into broader sustainability. It's not food as an isolated topic, as you'll see in Michael's talk, too. Um, and if we're going to talk about visions for the future, we need to talk about the drivers of the current perils that we're facing. This is just one of several that Michael and I will talk about. But if you look at uh, food prices and oil prices over the last uh, 10 years, there's a, 
what a 93 percent correlation that doesn't mean causation per se but what we should anticipate is that line's going to keep on going up and it's going to price the food available in this community out of the poorest of the poor now what are we talking about for poorest of the poor we're already the third worst state in child food insecurity in the country look at those mean incomes in the first column sells six thousand dollars per capita income three point thirteen thousand south tucson nine thousand dollars how are those families going to afford uh food if the prices continue to go up 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, uh per year and it's not just in metro tucson that we're seeing this our border towns are uh stripped down the the um, uh, loss of Mexican visitors uh, to Arizona because of our immigration debate has bankrupted nearly every town, lost incredible numbers of jobs. And the child poverty levels that we're seeing in southern Arizona communities, there's no other word for it except sinful That's that right. this many of our kids are already suffering child food insecurity. This problem is not going to go away unless we have a sea change of policies and practices in Southern Arizona. And as I said earlier, the most serious peril we're facing is going off the nutritional cliff, which also means going off the fiscal cliff in terms of uh, the cost of medical care in Southern Arizona. Half the population will need diabetes treatment by 2030 if nothing changes. Half the population of southern Arizona. The, the predominance of Hispanic and Native Americans, one of our great cultural assets of living in this region, is being wasted by the elders being on dialysis machines and kids 15 to 16 years of age weighing 180, 200 pounds and not being able to have the physical activities to engage with other kids. So first, how do we get the food system going? And one of those uh, things is that we have some great growers in this region, both immediately south of the border and immediately north of the border, like Jim McMahon is here from, from the Aravaca um, uh, region. And these people are growing great food, but not much of it is getting into the Tucson economy relative to what it should be. How can we process more of that food in or near Tucson so that food isn't traveling 1,200 miles, but food's traveling 30 or 35 miles with less of a carbon footprint. Well, there's a number of ways that uh, we can do that. And one thing that I think we need to do is use the old idea of industrial development zones. And down by Santa Vera at the airport, we have a border development zone. And there's these new things called green development zones, where we, we take the vegetables and the meats uh, uh, grown within 100 miles of here, build slaughterhouses, flour mills, community kitchens where, like in Albuquerque and Taos, 80 to 100 different businesses come in at different times of the day and make products, value-added products, from what is already grown in this area. For every dollar of that fresh produce or fresh meat, we can turn that into two dollars or more of value-added products and get a multiplier effect in our community that helps jumpstart other economic activities. We have a thousand pound gorilla in the county and that's that during the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan a number of ranches were bought and then leased back to the owners. So these, the management of these ranches is in transition there's criticism of how they're being managed, both from the ranching community and environmental community right now. But the great big question that no one's asking is, why is none of that meat from county-owned lands coming back into our local economy? Could it not even feed uh, the prisons, nursing homes, uh, schools, and hospitals, the public institutions that we uh, uh, have here? How do we get that meat back into this community? And we've been working on a plan with Ken Meter to co-locate a slaughterhouse, a blood meal processing, bone meal pl processing plant, hide canning plant, uh, biodiesel plant, and uh, charcuterie so that we're getting all the products, about 40 to $70 more per head of cattle 
if we co-locate these things with the slaughterhouse. We have one slaughtering facility in Arizona out at University of Arizona. Uh, John, who's been running it, has been running it since 1968. He will not be running it for the next 20 years. Sometime soon, he'll probably retire. We need a plan so that we have meat processed in this community and its other product saved and valued. Um, we can work with the county ranch land program to get local grass-fed beef into our public institutions, and as you know, that uh, meat is typically rich in omega-3 fatty acids and other healthful things that we need in our community. Second, how do we get the farmers and ranchers nearby to use for inputs the materials and energy that now go into waste streams around here? So the amazing thing is that uh, the biggest thing that we can do to relocalize and reduce outside inputs is not just getting local food into restaurants, but having the farms and ranchers use local compost, local blood meal, local bone meal for soil improvement, local labor, local seeds like what Native Seed Search sells, and get rid of our addiction of thinking everything from far away is better. We have 30 to 35 million pounds of unshippable produce uh, getting dumped between Tucson and Nogales every year once the, the uh, vegetables come across the border. Nogales is the third largest uh, port of entry in the United States and the largest inland port of entry for food in the world. And there's incredible waste associated with that that Feed America food banks uh, markets on the move are already using some of, but still incredible waste, and we're coming up with a plan to make sure that that compost gets on uh, back on lands and in gardens uh, to improve the soil fertility and water holding capacity of the soils. Okay, so the remarkable thing is that Tucson is the center of origin of garbage analysis. We had an old whole anthropology department <laughs> Um, analyzing garbage for 15 years here. The largest database in the world on one city's garbage. And that gives us an incredible advantage of planning strategic interventions. Um, particularly interesting is the fact that beverage containers are about 20 to 25 percent of what we throw into landfills. So here's a couple suggestions that we can do to get that stuff out of the waste streams uh, and uh, figure out other ways to give our kids beverages. Five cent tax on all beverage cans and bottles of a gallon or less, so no one in this community ever buys a big gold cup again and throws it away. Yay. How do we encourage more food uh, to be grown and harvested when within or near our city limits? And I'm going to, uh, uh, I know that Tress English has brought up many great innovations for this, but urban space is going to be the place where at least 20% of all our food uh, is grown. Places like Detroit, that's actually poorer than Tucson, has 3,500 acres of gardens and vacant lots where half the people growing food there are selling a portion of their food. We need to do hydroponics, hoop houses, greenhouses, everything, some of which we've heard from Michael can produce a million dollars of produce in a single year on an acre. We need that kind of urban farming to start now. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about subsidies now, a word that certain political strains hate, but we all subsidize places like this place. We all subsidize libraries. We all subsidize emergency health facilities. And we are now in emergency health crisis with diabetes. Putting 10 to 15 K in each neighborhood to jumpstart 60 new community gardens in this community would get our community garden number up above 100 where it should stay until affinity. Creating maps of gleanable fruit trees in public spaces and community gardens. Some of my students have already started to do that mapping public places with potable water. The city is considering doing that. Reducing regulatory hurdles to home poultry raising, uh, rain water and front yard gardens, a chicken in every pot and a pot in every garden. <laughs> and don't approve zoning for new housing developments unless they make space for, for edible landscaping. 
okay, the school issue, since we're losing so many schools this month in Arizona, maybe we uh, ought to talk about how we don't lose the kids uh, from our lives that are in those schools right now. The medical cost of the diabetes epidemic already sucks $3.8 billion a year from the Arizona economy. Uh, diabetes increasing 5% per decade in this predominantly Hispanic and Native American population. So by 2030, it'll be half the population suffering from this alone, if not other nutrition-related re diseases. Banning all soft drinks from schools and keeping beverage companies from donating to school sports pro programs. Banning all big cult drinks from everywhere in the city as New York City has already done. Don't you think the mayor got pushback on that one? If you care whether he had pushback, you can't do it if we're killing kids from it. And the third thing is taxing all nationally owned fast food franchises and using those funds to rebuild the food system. Can we tax one part of the system? Have you ever rented a car at the airport? There's an airport tax that makes that car cost $15 a day more. You can walk five blocks and rent the same car for $15 less. So we do differentially tax people, out-of-staters or whatever, who want to get a car at the airport. Why can we not tax uh, uh, fast food chains that are killing our kids? Six. How do we grow food in uh, Metro Tucson in ways that reduce the urban heat island effect, sequester carbon, harvest rainwater and stormwater? The LEAF meeting that we had in the fall, I uh, had a uh, couple hundred people talking about that. Returning to edible perennial landscaping is part of it. Designing all new roads and parking lots to harvest rainwater for edible plantings in the medians and treating wastewater available for fruit and nut tree plantings to sequester carbon in cool urban areas. Okay, how are we gonna do this if we're all broke, okay? You may not all be poor in this room, but I can damn sure guarantee you that even if you're not poor, most of you are broke. How many of you are broke? Okay, how are we gonna fund this? We have to get creative. And there's some great things that other communities are doing. Local and state credit unions, they're getting on the boards of those and saying, why are you giving business investments out of state when we need that money, that equity, and those loans in state? How many of you have ever thought about running for the board of the credit union where you stash your money. We're much more stable institutions than those things on Wall Street right now. We need to take over the credit unions with the visionaries that are in this room. The same kind of thing as uh, the slow money movement that Michael and I have been participating in. Uh, we had a meeting in Elgin, uh, Arizona that 70 of you came to within an hour and a half People pledged more than $160,000 to new food and farming microenterprises pitched by people in that room. If we had each of you write on a card how much liquid wealth you have available to invest in local businesses, food and farming microenterprises, even if you just had $75 for this year and maybe $150 next year, we would have some collective wealth to start some of this stuff. If we had a food financing summit for Tucson next fall, invited foundations, public agencies, angel investors, and uh, people that want to see these changes happen, I think we could have a pool of two and a half million dollars by the end of next year. How many people are on board for trying to see more of the local wealth go into local businesses. Stand up if you're for that idea. <laughs> okay, we're going to remember who stood up. Now. So this is the kind of uh, food financing summit we need where people like Jaime de Zubeldi of Rezonation Farm that farm that has kind of like a hip hop ish name, stands up in front of us like he did at the Border Food Summit in his bee 
suit, not his birthday suit, his bee suit, and gave us one of the best pitches I've ever heard. Paul and Sarah Schwenison have been doing this. They're trying to raise 1.2 million to, to really ramp up grass-fed uh, production uh, in southern Arizona. So this is not only possible, it's doable, and it's doable with the kinds of talent we have in this room. A, how do we capture more tourist dollars that help, can help us uh, rebuild infrastructure and maintain our unique food traditions? I helped New Orleans after Katrina, Rita, and the Deep Horizon oil spill apply to be one of UNESCO's world cities of gastronomy for its mix of Cajun and Creole traditions. Since those hurricanes, more restaurants have come back and become the meeting grounds in New Orleans than the number of restaurants that they had prior to the floods and hurricanes. Tucson has a unique place in the history of Mexican-American fusion cuisine, Native American cuisine. We need to attract tourists here and use that tourist money to our restaurants, gift shops, and other venues to help jumpstart this restructuring of our food system. Nine, how do we grow more farmers, ranchers, gar and gardeners to usher in the 25% food relocalization effort? I'm gonna embarrass her because I usually do that, but Regina, where are you with the National Young Farmers Coalition? She has made more exciting contacts with young people that wanna be farmers in this community and other communities in the West in the last three months than I had ever imagined. And she and many other youth in this uh, room are on fire, and we need to keep them on fire by supporting them in their efforts to get more people on board as new farmers. And asking the university to train <coughs> at least 50 new farmers each year, young people who get special scholarships if they agree to be farmers for three years just like we ask that of doctors or other people who do internships after school would be great. When I went to U of A in ag school, three of the 50 people I went to school with became farmers. We were basically told, if you're getting a degree, don't become a farmer. Uh, educate yourself away from the land. And we have to turn the purpose of our land-grant college around so it educates people to be back on the land. Final, the, finally, the other uh, thousand pound gorilla in the room is that one quarter of all the farm and ranch land lost in the entire country has been in the Sun Belt states over the last 50 years. Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, and Texas contribute over one quarter of all the farmland lost in this country. We've built on it, we've um, uh, paved it, we've taken the water away from it, we've done every possible thing. So we've named um, subdivisions, happy farm subdivision and all that crap, <laughs> Rancho Sin Vacas. <laughs> when are we gonna turn this around where the land is value for its highest intrinsic use to humankind? And the interesting thing is that in a poll we did a couple years ago, 70% of Arizonans said that they'd be in favor of setting a wa aside water sufficient for future food security rather than seeing it usurped by unbridled growth. Everything in the last century of statehood has moved the other direction. Are we ready to move back so that we value the land and water as part of our food security. And so I suggest that we need something like the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, like a county office of the food shed that does the planning to secure water exclusively for the future of food production in our area. The last thing I'll say, that talent, the drive, the motivation, the inspiration is in this room. There's incredible talent here. Some of you I've known well over half my life. You've been my teachers, the people who've inspired me. You're the people that can make a difference so that our kids grow up without diabetes as their inevitable fate. And I pray that you'll activate yourselves to do it. Thank you.